Thanks for checking out this movie review video. This is for the 2010 film Tucker and Dale vs. Evil, and this is actually one of my favorite horror comedies. Actually, I know that there are probably a lot of people out there who love this film and would say that it's one of their favorite horror comedies, uh, not just because it's funny, because it is funny, but it's very cleverly written. And these are the types of films that I really like to see where they kind of take a uh, formula, a film formula, and they turn it on its head somehow. And for that reason, it's very ingeniously written. It's very cleverly written because they take the the idea of the uh, college kids going off to the wood, with, off to the woods, and so many horror films start that way. You know, slashers. You know, things like The Evil Dead, um, Wrong Turn. You know, things like that. So they take that idea, they and they take more of the wrong turn aspect where it's kind of the country folk who are the killers, and they switch that around and make it all about misunderstanding and if you look at it from a different point of view maybe this is not what's going on and I it's brilliant the way it's written so I love this film anyway uh, directed by Eli Craig it's uh, who also did Zombieland TV movie there's a Zombieland TV movie and uh, the movie Little Evil which is on Netflix right now which if you if you have not seen Little Evil that's another really good horror comedy in my opinion I have seen it a few times I haven't done a review for it yet I will have to do that again and I will have no problem watching it again because it's a lot of fun it was writ written uh, ugh, sorry written by Eli Craig and Morgan Jurgensen stars Alan Tudyk which a lot of people know Alan Tudyk from things like Firefly the show Firefly which is great Dodgeball Death at a Funeral Wreck-It Ralph, he was King Candy in that, did a great job. Big Hero 6, uh, he was in Rogue One and Santa Clarita Diet. Um, he's actually, he's done a lot of voice acting uh, with like cartoons and stuff like that. And then Tyler Labine is in this. Uh, at, he's from Zack and Mary Make a Porno, the show Reaper, which if you have not seen Reaper and you like Tyler Labine, you have got to see Reaper. That show is really funny and really well done. Little Evil, he was also in that. Super Troopers 2, the film Escape Room, which I need to see, and the TV drama New Amsterdam, which my wife watches, I do not, but she says he does a really good job in that. And one of the big things is Tudyk and Labine together, I think their chemistry is really good in this film, and that's one of the things that really sells the film uh, in conjunction with the fact that the, the dialogue that's written for them is really good, and their character development is really good, too. Like, they feel real. The things they say feel realistic for who they are as characters, and their relationship and how they interact with each other feels super real and fun. That's the other great thing. The budget of this film was $5 million and ended up making $5.7 million. So it didn't make, you know, it made $700,000, basically. So, okay, they weren't in the hole, but didn't make a lot. Uh, Craig has discussed a sequel similar to From Dust Till Dawn or Tucker and Dale Go to Yale, which signed me up for either of those, which he described as uh, the Tucker and Dale Go to Yale when he described it as Goodwill Hunting meets the Texas Chainsaw Massacre. That sounds wonderful to me. I like both those movies and together sounds great. Um, in 2017, Alan Tudyk was asked about a sequel and he said a script was written but is disappointing, so most likely it's actually not going to move forward. I know this has been some flip-flopping flip back and forth about will there be another duck tail, uh, Tucker and Dale, will there not? Um, so at the moment it's looking more like not, unfortunately. Uh, so yeah. So you think the found footage stuff in the very beginning of this film is going to be kind of the, the this is what happened in the past and then it flashes forward, but no. I like this kind of switch where you think that, but then by the end of the film you realize, oh, what happened in the very beginning with that found footage is actually a continuation of this film. That's what happened at the end. So, uh, well, after the end, much later. Uh, so I quite enjoyed that. I thought that was a cool idea to, uh, to include that. Uh, when Tucker and Dale passed the college kids in their truck initially on the road, the appearance of them being creepy has to do a lot with the scary music, which highlights how much soundtrack can really uh, telegraph to you how you're supposed to be feeling and actually influence how you feel about things. You know, look at that aspect of, you know, the college kids are looking there like, oh, look at these guys. So it's partially in the acting of the college kids acting afraid, but it's even more so with the creepy, scary music that they play when they're showing, 
Dale looking out the window at them with this kind of blank stare. Um, if they had played some other type of music, it would have played out a lot differently, like something light and funny. It wouldn't have seemed as scary or creepy or anything like that. So I think it's a really good thing to note with this film and kind of every film you watch is that music has a very large part in helping you out with how you should feel. Now, sometimes that's done too much, and that's what I don't like. Like, they're leading you too much. I like to be led maybe just a little bit, but with this film, it's very appropriate how they did it because it's basically making a point that they're trying to make with the script, which is this is how you would typically feel in this situation, but there's really something else going on. So, uh, love that. I like that it's a typical backwoods slasher setup, but then they shift to the other perspective, and that's one of the best things. Uh, it ends up being all about miscommunication, misunderstanding, basically, and I'll talk a little bit more about that later. But I love how they did it because when these misunderstandings happen, when the bad things end up happening that are accidents, basically, you can see them from both sides. And that's that speaks to how good the script is and how well thought out it was and all of the scenarios that it brings up. Because you know where Tucker and Dale are coming from, but you can also see where the college kids would see that it's creepy or scary or that they have ill intent. So I love the fact that you can see those two things and you're not fully seeing from one side of the perspective with the story. I love when Dale, Dale, geez, sorry, when Dale goes up to the college kids and starts laughing nervously, especially because this is one of those moments where you see it from both sides. You understand because of the conversation that uh, Dale just had with Tucker that he just gets nervous and so he doesn't really know what to do and it's more of like a nervous laughing. So when he goes up, you understand that he's just nervous and that's all is that's playing out there. But when you think about the perspective from the college kids and how they react to it, you can see where that looks creepy and unsettling. And like this guy is going to kill them because they, he was just looking at them on the road. They don't know him. And, you know, going into this, their whole assumption is, you know, these backwoods folk are liable to kill you. I mean, they came in with a prejudice against people who look like they're from the country. So, yeah. It's great that their vac vacation home looks so scary and that they're excited about that. And I think that it's it's good to note that it kind of looks like the, the not exactly, but kind of looks like the cabin in um, Evil Dead and also Cabin in the Woods because that's what that's based off of. So I like that kind of uh, homage in a way. During the flashback story, there's a tracking shot from above that I did not like. Um, the flashback story of, you know, the, the country folk who were killers that Chad was talking about when they were around the bonfire. Um, and there was a tracking shot of one woman when she was running through the woods and the shot was from above. And it was really bouncing a lot. So that was a really bad shot. That's the only kind of like technical thing that I didn't really like in the film. Um, I just happened to catch it this time around. I don't really catch it any other time, so but because it's relatively quick, so not a huge deal. Um, already talked about that. Uh, the chainsaw hornet nest, I think, is one of the funniest moments, especially because you know that guy's going in. He's going to go up to the door. It just so happens that at that time, uh, Tucker has chainsawed through a log into a hornet's nest, and then they're all coming out at him. And he starts running and he's like flailing around the chainsaw and looking like a crazy guy wielding a chainsaw going after this dude. So it's another one of those moments where you see it from both perspectives once again. And you can easily see that from the kid's perspective because someone running at you from around this creepy house, wielding a chainsaw and flinging it around and yelling, I would be afraid too. I definitely would. Allison talking about wanting to be a psychologist and saying a lot of problems stem from a lack of communication is speaking exactly to the heart of this film and what's at play in this film. This is one of those moments of the character telling you as the audience, this is what's happening in the film, but not doing it in a way where it's like, hey, you're a stupid audience, let me tell you, let me lead you by the hand. It's doing it in a kind of ironic and funny way, just kind of saying, oh, check this out. Uh, but that's exactly what's at play there is she talks about, you know, I feel like a lot of situations are not having enough communication, misunderstandings. And that's exactly what this film is, is a series of misunderstandings and no communication or improper communication. 
It becomes very clear pretty early on that Chad is the real villain, which is interesting because it's that switch, because you'd usually assume that the person from the country is going to be the killer versus the person from the city. Uh, but then you do have that twist at the end when you find out that Chad, in fact, is um, the, his father was one of those country folk killers. So then you're just like, okay, so now he's part city folk. But it's really not about bloodline at that point. It's kind of about how you were brought up, how you were living now. So he still is firmly city folk. He just loses it even more when he finds out that his father was a killer. And it kind of plays a little bit to, without saying it outright, it plays a little bit into the genetics of it, saying that, you know, if your father is a kill killer, then maybe you genetically will turn out to be a killer too. So it plays on that a little bit. And it is a good twist at the end too. I thought that was a cool twist where you find that out. Because this whole time, Chad has been has been saying that, you know, his parents were a victim of these people, and turns out one of his parents was them. There's a little country in Allison with her farm upbringing and not being afraid to do manual labor and knowing what she's doing. And then there's a little bit of city in Dale because of his uh, trivia intellect. And that's how, you know, Allison and Dale end up really connecting. And it's interesting because those two are the bridge. You know, they could be the bridge to kind of bring those two cultures, I guess, together of the city folk and the country folk. Um, because they understand each other after talking for a while, and they have, they have, like I said, like qualities that kind of cross over to the other side, so they can kind of find common ground, talk to each other, understand each other, and I like how they did that with the characters. Um, so it's it's cool. The wood chipper scene. Everybody knows the wood chipper scene from this film. Probably f a favorite scene for a lot of people. It is one of my favorites as well, uh, where the guy just starts running at Tucker, and he gets out of the way and he throws himself into the wood chipper and it's gory as hell and I love that but it's also funny as hell the way it's set up and the way it plays out and how he's grabbing him and trying to pull him out and it's just like and the blood sp spraying everywhere I love that scene that's I look forward to that scene every time I watch this film and I've seen this film a pretty good amount of times it is hilarious when Tucker says it's Dale's fault because he's such a good Samaritan um, but it's kind of true at the same time. Like, he's trying to be nice. He's trying to be outgoing. He was also trying to be a good Samaritan by helping Allison out because she would have drowned otherwise. But then I guess you could say that, like Dale said to Tucker, if we weren't out there fishing in the first place, she probably wouldn't have fallen. But then again, I guess you can't know that for sure. So, but anyway, um, I just thought that was kind of funny. He's just like, it's your fault for trying to be a good Samaritan. Uh, yeah. Chad's post uh, created a general, or I'm sorry, ugh. Chad's, Chad's past created a generalized hatred for all rural people. Uh, and at one point, he even says to Dale, your kind. Now, this is very important to kind of highlight what's really at play in this film, which is the divide, the chasm that exists even in current society between people from the country and people from the city. And you got to think, you know, why is that? And that's mainly because when you live in one area, one type of area, with all people who are about the same as you culturally, and then these people are doing the same thing, but their culture is different than yours, when these people cross paths or you're hearing about each other or you're passing judgments on each other, you don't understand. You don't connect with those people. You don't know how to feel about them necessarily because there's, there's not necessarily anything you feel that's in common and you don't understand how they live or why they do what they do. So it creates this issue where you have misunderstandings. You have lack of communication. And within our society, I think that's a lot of a problem that does happen between people who are from the country and people who are from the city. You know, people get very absorbed into where they live and how they, how they live there and the culture there that they have a hard time kind of stepping outside of that and seeing a point of view from another person's culture, from where they live, from how they live. And, um, you know, it just kind of speaks to it'd be better if we could all be more open-minded and, and approach situations from, okay, how are you seeing things? You know, let me listen. Let me try to understand. Let me try to put myself in your shoes and see where you're coming from as opposed to just basing everything off of your life situation. And I think that's something that, it's a natural thing, I think, for people to just 
base all of their choices and base all of their judgments and perspective off of, you know, everything that's happened in their life and has shaped them or how they live or where they live because it's natural. Like you just feel that, but it's, you should do the work to try and stop yourself from, from filtering everything through those lenses and being more open-minded and saying, well, you know, this person I'm talking to right here, they've had different a different upbringing than me. They've had different life experiences than me. They live in a different situation right now. Their economic situation may be different. I mean, you don't know. So just listen, you know, just saying. Sorry if that was kind of a too long diatribe for Tucker and Dale versus Evil. And too serious, actually. But let's get back to the fun stuff. When the girl tries to put out the, the uh, fire that's on the guy that starts on his leg on his pants, which... First of all, that's funny because Chad like throws the lantern and then it hits the guy's leg and it starts spreading. And then the girl wants to put it out and she just grabs that container and Tucker and Dale are both like, no, 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 don't throw that. And she throws it on and just, boom, he goes up into like 100% flames. That's another one of my favorite moments because the way they played it out is insanely funny. I mean, it's mess. I mean, obviously in a messed up, morbid way, it's funny, but it's insanely funny. But that's that's his whole film. Like, it's a dark, morbid, funny. That's why it's horror comedy, you know. The truck crash scene. This looks really good. Think about this. Think back to the truck crashing scene where they're driving. It's um, I think it's Dale's driving the truck, and the the camera's in the back, and they end up. He's not paying attention. They end up hitting a tree. Well, the perspective of the camera from the back seat. You see the truck hitting the tree, and then you just see, like, kind of the glimmer of all this glass from the windshield coming in, and then it blacks it out. And, like, everyone kind of, like, you know, they get the whiplash, their heads go forward. It looks great. Like, rewatch that scene. It looks really good. It was very well ex executed from a visual standpoint. I loved it. And then the final thing in film that I have to talk about is Tucker's finger reattachment. I thought that was hilarious um, how they gave him like a, one of one of the fingers was a woman's finger. I thought that was hilarious. And then also the fact that um, Dale brings him a PBR. He's just like, look what I got for you. That's a PBR right there. <laughs> it's just so funny, man. Which is funny because PBR is a very hipster beer, at least where I live in near Baltimore area in Maryland. PBR is consumed by a lot of hipsters. It's a very cool cool hipster beer just saying i do not drink it though i drink craft beer that's my thing um this film works so well because it's a new take on an old formula like i was talking about seeing the other side of things actually makes you view these types of films in the future differently well i don't know if it does for you but for me after the first time i saw tucker and dale versus evil i remember every other film i would watch that would have this type of setup I would think about it from the other side of the perspective, and I'm just like, what does this look like from the side of the other people? And what if this was a Tucker and Dale situation of just miscommunication, misunderstanding? So I like to do that kind of mental gymnastics when I'm watching these films. Um, I already talked about that. Uh, yep, and that's basically it. I do like this film. I think, like I was saying, it's very well written. It's very well executed. And like I said, if you have not seen Little Evil, it's by the same director. It is on Netflix. It will stay on Netflix because it's one of their original films. Um, definitely check out Little Evil. It's really good. It has Adam Scott in it from uh, Parks and Rec. So if that sells you on it, good. It's it's good. Um, anyway, uh, now i got to give this a star rating. So you can tell I really like this film. It's not like the best film ever. It's not unbelievably phenomenal. But out of five stars with uh, half stars in play, I'm going to give it a very solid four star rating. I was thinking about maybe between four and four and a half, um, but I think it's more appropriate to go four. Um, if I did quarters, I would definitely do 4.25. But four star rating for Tucker and Dale versus Evil. I really like this film. I watch it. I've watched it many times, and I will continue to watch it, especially in October. But uh, put some comments down here. Let me hear about your love or your hatred for Tucker and Dale vs. Evil. I'm sure there are people out there who don't like it. I'd, I would be interested in knowing why that is. Uh, and that's fine. That's your perspective. It's all good. Um, and, yeah, do me a quick favor, though. Hit that subscribe button. That's your best way to repay me if you like this video or any video I've ever done. Uh, it's a quick way to repay me for that because, you know, you're not paying money. 
I'm not making money. Uh, so my motivation comes in the form of getting new subscribers and seeing that people are actually consuming what I'm putting out there. So I, I really would appreciate that. And also, if you're going to do that, make sure you hit the notification bell. And that way, you know, if I'm putting up a new, you know, review video or an unboxing or doing a live stream or any of that fun stuff. But regardless, I do appreciate you checking this video out. And until next time, keep it brutal.